brother, you must fight. Keep on the firing line. There are many dangers which we all must face. If we die still fighting, there is no disgrace. Cowards in the service should not have a place. Keep on the firing line. You must fight and be brave against all One thirty six, precious name. seated turn back to, to hymn number 100 100 
This evening, turn over to hymn number 225. 225. King's kids are dismissed. Man, everybody else, if you'll go to Philippians chapter number three. Philippians chapter three. <laughs> it won't be long, buddy. <laughs> All right, Philippians chapter number three. And I'll ask you to stand with me if you're able this evening as we honor the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> Philippians chapter number 3, and we'll start in the first verse. Verse number 1 says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might have all uh, that I, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ." And be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him, and the power of His resurrection, and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. I want to bring our lesson this evening of a new course of life. A new course of life. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank You once again for allowing us the privilege of being able to be here this evening. Thank You, Lord, for the hymns that have been sung and for the preparation of our hearts, Lord, for all the things that You desire for us to be able to see. Thank You for such a glorious passage of Scripture that reminds us of the reason of our rejoicing. And I pray, Father, that we would be able to take these truths and apply them to our hearts and lives and see the joy that is ours for being in Christ. And we just want to thank You for it and praise You for all things. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank You. Please do be seated. 
So if you remember, we've been looking at a few things as we go through. We uh, 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 looking at what revival is through the book of Ezra, looking at resiliency through the book of Jude, and then there's rejoicing uh, through the book of Philippians. And as we look through this matter of rejoicing of a Christian, it's different than anything else that you can uh, possibly imagine. The world uh, cannot offer you the type of rejoicing that is found in Christ. And that's what Paul is, is getting across at this point. The joy of the Lord Lord uh, is your strength, is what it says in Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, God gives us joy that remains. He gives us joy that fills. It talks about it in John chapter number 15. And uh, it's very personal. Uh, the rejoicing that a believer gets to experience is not just a one size fits all. I love that. Uh, somebody can experience joy in different ways. Amen. Now, uh, the way that it's expressed, the way that it's very personalized to you is going to be uh, different. The type of joy that you know is personal, the way that joy is expressed, it's personal. Uh, some people have joy, and, and the joyous people that they are, they laugh. Hey, Amen. That's just who they are. Man, they laugh. Uh, some people shout. Some people get teary. Uh, the emotions may come about in different manners. Uh, whenever, a, whenever a person Here's the truth of the uh, salvation that's available in the Lord Jesus Christ and how He took uh, our sin upon Himself and He died in our place. Sometimes it just causes somebody to shout an amen. There's just something there and you just can't help but just say, Amen! I agree! So be it! Greatest day ever! There's just something that wells up. Other people, they don't like there to be any, any uh, spoken thing at all because it's like it takes away from the presence of God at that point. Which one's right? Yeah, it's how the Holy Spirit leads a person, right? Amen. So as long as it's not a put on type of aspect, you know, you understand what we're talking about. But, but whenever the, the Holy Spirit is leading, there's going to be a difference that's there. It's, it's something that's personal. Uh, God doesn't get you to just change your entire personality or anything like that. He just, boy, He just emphasizes His joy and His presence in, in who you are. There's some things that we get to experience that the world just does not get to know. And it brings such great joy to the life of a believer. Ever think about some of the things that just cause you to joy that nobody else knows anything about? Being saved and know it. Amen. Amen. That brings joy to a believer. Daily communion with God and prayer. Oh, that brings joy. Being able to know that you've got a heavenly Father that you can go, uh, boldly come to the throne of grace and just bring your petitions to Him. Reading the Bible brings joy. Amen? There's something special about that, to have that communion that's there. Sharing the gospel with somebody and seeing, seeing somebody come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. There is nothing, absolutely nothing greater than that. That brings joy to a believer. Seeing a person take a step of obedience following the Lord and in baptism or maybe surrendering some uh, portion of their life to the Lord. Maybe uh, when somebody yields their life to God and they say, you know what, God has called me to preach the gospel or God has, uh, you know, he's laid a decision and that person has just been faithful. Man, that causes joy in a believer's life because of that obedience. Attending church brings joy to a believer. Somebody's not saved, miserable time for them. You ever notice somebody, they're miserable in church, they don't want to be there, they can't wait, it's like five minutes in, are we done yet? Uh, you know, there's something wrong there, amen? A Christian, man, you get to be around your people, amen? amen. There's, a, there's an excitement about being in the church house. Being faithful brings joy. Giving brings joy. You know, that's pretty awesome. Uh, that's something that you, that you don't find if you don't know Christ as Savior, amen? Somebody knows Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, it's it's one of the most blessing things just to be able to invest in the work of the ministry. Somebody's not saved, that's a horrible thing. It's like, you want me to take my hard-earned money and give it to somebody? I don't know what they're doing. You know, all of a sudden there's that, and sometimes Christians struggle with that too, amen? Uh, but, but I should say a surrendered Christian, that's a great joy to be able to give. Looking for the return of Christ, oh, that brings joy. So, no, He's coming again, amen? So as Paul begins this third chapter, notice what he says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Everybody's excited whenever the preacher says, finally. Amen? Amen. This is where Paul says, uh, we're having an invitation. And he's kind of misleading them a little bit. Only, only, you know, preacher, whenever he says, finally, and he's only halfway through with the book. <laughs> they, they, they hadn't gone through all the scrolls yet to figure out. It's like, we're only halfway, halfway done. In conclusion. 
But he's, he says, in light of everything that we've been going through through the book of Philippians, he says, I want you to know that there is a final matter that I want to address throughout the remainder of the book, however long it is. And he's talking about the rejoicing in Christ. He's talking about there's a whole new course in life, and they can rejoice even in difficult days. So Paul's going to give the secrets of Christian joy, and it has to do with a couple of key things as you start looking through the passage here. Uh, first of all, it has to do with purity, and then it also has to do with perspective. And he says, your joy as a Christian is going to be greatly tied to that matter of purity and the matter of perspective. And you, uh, you can either have joy or you can lose joy by both. What does that mean? Uh, you can have joy or lose joy based on whether or not you're living life in accordance with the Word of God. Or if your perspective, if your attention gets focused on other things. And so our joy is, is tied to uh, those two oftentimes. So this is coming from the man in prison. Hey Amen. Keep that in mind. Uh, he knows what he's talking about. If here's a guy who is in jail and he can still talk to somebody about joy, he knows something about it. He's got something to be able to, to share. Uh, now if, he's, if, if he were to, to dwell on his sorrows, or if he was to be uh, overcome by his physical limitations and the fact that he couldn't be where he necessarily thought that he, he might want to be, he could be completely distressed and depressed. Amen. Uh, if it was in his mind, he says, this is what I need to do. I need to, I just need to be here. I don't need to be in jail. I need to be with you. Now, if that was the perspective that he would have had to begin with, then it would have been really hard for him to have joy. That's where he starts off in the first couple of chapters and he says, even though I am where I am, I rejoice knowing that I'm right where God wants me to be. And if I'm right where God wants me to be, then I can, be, then I can have joy, I can have a spirit of rejoicing even in the midst of hard times. And so that's what it is that he's sharing. He knows what it is that he's talking about. You know that happens to any of us as well. Uh, if, if, we, if we get our eyes off of Christ... We set our perspective on something else. We've got our idea of the way that life should be treating us, and it's not treating us the right way. It's easy for us to get settled into this kind of a heartache and, and period of depression, and it starts to grow in our lives. And you know what? If, if we don't set our attention where it's supposed to be on Christ, then that matter of depression is going to continue on, and it's going to lead to bitterness, and it's going to lead to resentment, it's going to lead to rebellion and unprofitability as a child of God. So, we'll be known by this constant spiritual defeat instead of known as a people of joy. But if, it's, if our attention is settled on the Lord Jesus Christ, then we're going to be able to have joy regardless of the circumstances and distractions and all those type of things. So, right about here, Paul is probably thinking, as he's, he's launching into this, this finally, he's probably thinking, you guys have heard all this before. This right about here, there's going to be somebody that is going to tune me out. Now, how do we know that? Look at what he says in verse 1. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Now, watch this. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. He says, there's some assurance for you about what's going on here. And he's making the confession. He says, you know what? Uh, there's going to be some things here that sound like what I've already told you. But he's perfectly okay repeating himself. He says, I know I'm repeating myself. That's okay. Amen. It's going to give them assurance. A repetition. Repetition is, is beneficial and it is necessary. Uh, sometimes preachers repeat sermons. Sometimes it's because they're lazy and they hadn't studied. Most of the time it's because they know this is what we need spiritually to be able to get where we're going. Now, I, I believe this probably happens to every preacher, but probably just me. Uh, I always had that thought, well, I just preached on that. I mean, that's already settled then. And, and then somebody would ask a question. It's like, well, why would you ask that question? Well, I just had a sermon about that. Didn't that answer all the questions that you ever had to know about that topic? No. No, it didn't. You know, I, I, and, and, you know, the more that I do this, uh, Brother Hart could probably testify I'm sure. But, but the more that you do it I think alright out of all the sermon you know there may be like 10% of what actually gets taken in and it's going to be a different 10% by every person. Amen. 
So there's a need sometimes for some repetition. There's a need sometimes whenever you see things going on, and, and I'll think this sometime, and I'll think, I'll think, I just preached out of this passage. Well, I'll go back and look, and it'll have been eight years ago. You know, in my mind it seems like it just happened, but that's just because of this, the downfall of my mind. And I think, I just talked about that. No, it's been a long time. It's been a long time. There's times where there has to be a little bit of repetition that's there. It's going to be beneficial. Rejoicing in the Lord is something we need repetition on. We need the, the reminders about. Rejoicing in the Lord will help you in living a holy life. A lot of times we get kind of covered up with griping or complaining or something like that. It's just human nature. Griping has never presented any kind of a godliness. Right. Amen? It always works in reverse. So that brings up this first element of a new course of life of rejoicing. And the first thing I want you to notice, there is a resolved purity. There's a resolved purity. Verse number two, he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. He starts off and he says, uh, you want to have rejoicing? Uh, first off, watch out for some stuff. He said, there's some stuff that can rob you of rejoicing. If there's going to be rejoicing in the life of a believer, there has to be some resisting of things that are against God. There's got to be some things that, 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 that we understand they are, they are not uh, 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 good. They're, it's not going to be something that's going to promote God's will. So what does Paul say that there should be to resist? First of all, he says, beware of dogs. Beware of dogs. That's not talking about German Shepherd, amen? So uh, it's a descriptive term that oftentimes, to be honest, we kind of miss out on today. Because we don't think of dogs the same way as they did during that day. In our day, man, dogs are this man's best friend, right? I mean, you got your dogs curled up at the foot of your bed, and they're, you know, so sweet and bring you slippers and all this kind of stuff. Not, not our dogs, but <clears throat> I've heard people have dogs like that. So <clears throat> our dogs are outside right now. But anyway, but in our day, honestly, there's dogs that get treated better than kids. Amen. So whenever he says beware of dogs, you're like, well, what's wrong with that? In Paul's day, they were not man's best friends. Dogs were, were things that were dirty and vicious and untamed and vile. The, the picture that I always get in my mind whenever I think about dogs in their day, it's the same picture that I have of hyenas today. I don't know about y'all, but I never look at a hyena and think, oh, they're so cute. I just look at them, it's like nasty little vermin. I mean, little backbiters. You know, they, 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 they're little cowards. They're, they're always going in. They're, they're trying to nip something in the, in the back, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And they're always waiting for the buddies to pile in to take out something good. I mean, you just look at them, they're like a bunch of little scavengers. They all look like they got mange. That's what I think of. Yeah. Whenever I start thinking about dogs, and that's the, the presentation that's given here as well. When the Bible speaks of people being dogs, and he says, beware of dogs, it's speaking to those that lived vile lives. Yep. He says, you want to have joy? You be careful of people that are living vile lives. If your companionship is with those that have, have such a degraded character, he says, it won't be long, you're going to be corrupted. Yep. It won't be long, it's going to rub off on you. And Paul's telling him, he says, listen, beware of your close associations. Make sure you're taking account of those that you're spending all your time around. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. It will rob you of your ability for rejoicing. He says, Beware of that. Secondly, he says there in verse number 2, he says, Beware of evil workers. Beware of evil workers. What is that? Deceivers. He's talking about deception. You know the world is full of deceivers. Amen? comes in all different shapes and Forms, politicians, that's a quick, quick and easy one. Rank that one right before car salesmen. Amen. Amen. By the way, religious leaders can also be very deceptive. Amen. Those that preach the prosperity gospel try to uh, advance personally on the gullibility of people. I remember a man that I worked with, we were uh, in the office. One day, and I'd been talking to him about the Lord, and he, he was, boy, he was just kind of despondent and everything, and he was going through a divorce and, and, uh, and all this, and, and he made the statement. He said, you know what? He said, I was watching this lady that was preaching. Okay. So, yeah, there was like, you know, okay, well, let's see where this is. I'm sure it's going to turn out well. But anyway, he said, she said, she looked right into the camera, and she said, 
I feel that there's some man out there that's going through a divorce. And you know, if you can just humble your money, you know, God will give you a blessing because you're just turning it over to him. And that's the way that, you, and, and so he sent her a hundred bucks. I said, you are a sucker. Amen. I said, you mean to tell me that you ha it hadn't crossed your mind that of all the millions of people that are watching, there might be somebody going through a divorce? Yeah. You know, and I was trying to tell him, I was like, look, man, get your instruction from the Word of God. And, and, and boy, that would have just solved a whole bunch right there. Amen. And he would have saved a hundred bucks. <laughs> Beware of evil workers. Beware of the deception that comes about even in religious things. Beware of news outlets. Amen. A lot of deceiving going on. Many people allow the political world to be able to set their whole view of morality. What they think is right or wrong instead of the Word of God. The way of the world is not to be confused with the ways of God. Many people try to be morally upstanding, but they base it on the culture of the day and what they're told on NBC is fashionable and good. Man, beware. He says, watch out. He says, you will lose your joy... If you're trying to align yourself with what is the, the culturally acceptable thing in the world, but it's going against the Word of God. You'll never be able to go against the Word of God and have joy in your life. Third, he says, beware of the concision. It's the only time in the Word of God that that word concision is used. It's an interesting phrase. It means mutilation. It means mutilation. The cutting of the flesh. Remember on Mount Carmel, the Baal prophets were there and, and they were having their battle with Elijah. And remember what they were doing. They were calling out on Baal to be able to answer. Remember whoever answered by fire was going to be the God. That's who it was that they were going to worship. And, and Elijah told him, he says, listen, you guys go first. And they got up there and, and they began to cry out, oh, Baal, hear us. Oh, Baal, hear us. And he says, he says maybe you need to shout a little louder. louder. Maybe, maybe he's asleep. And they're like, yeah, that's right. Oh, Baal, hear us. And all of a sudden they start cutting themselves. And they, they think that they're going to somehow gain his attention by mutilate, mutilating themselves. And it was completely senseless. That same kind of mentality is what some of the Judaizers had, thinking that the Gentiles had to circumcise and become Jews before God would be able to hear them. That's exactly what he's talking about as he goes on. You're going to see that. But, it, but that thought was is if they could just perform some kind of a religious action, that would be able to bring salvation. And, you know, it'd be no better than the heathen just cutting their flesh. That's what it would boil down to. Today, if there was a thought that there was some kind of a religious activity that you could do to be able to gain some extra favor by God or maybe gain your salvation because of that religious action... Uh, it would be the same kind of word. That would be that concision. If it was church membership, if it was baptism, if it was confirmation, anything other than the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation, that would degrade the purity of the gospel. And it robbed them of the joy found in Christ. So Paul says, he said, watch out for degradation. Watch out for deceit. Watch out for false doctrine. Those are things that would corrupt your steps and actually rob you of the joy that should be found in Christ. And he gives evidence of it. Look at it in verse number three. He says, for we are the circumcision. Now he was just talking about that concision right there, that mutilating of the flesh. He said, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. He said, where are you going to get joy from? He said, it's going to start with faith. Faith is going to be the beginning. That's the, the starting point of joy. Paul was a Jew, but his joy wasn't because he was a Jew. His joy came because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And on top of that, not just faith, but honoring the Lord causes that joy to continue. You know, a lot of times people, Christians, can miss out on joy whenever we start getting away from the things of God. Whenever we start getting away from God, we're not honoring the Lord in the way that we should. We start missing out on joy. The first thing a, a saved person wants to do, what is it? Worship. And we think about that. We're like, well, you know, you're supposed to witness. Yeah, you should. should be witnessing. But you know, the first thing that happens whenever a person is saved, there's that goal or desire of the heart just to be able to worship God. 
You know, that comes in a corporate form. You want to be able to gather together. You want to be able to sing together. There's something special about getting together with God's people, but it also happens individually in the way that we reverence the Lord by giving Him the ability to show us things that should be removed in our life. Amen? That's a form of worship. Amen? It's whenever we start looking at our own life and say, you know, as a child of God, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit starts saying, there's some stuff that's there. And you say, all right, Lord, I'm turning that over to you. That doesn't have to happen in a church service. That happens in that quiet time between you and God. That's whenever He begins to speak to your heart. He starts showing you things out of, the, out of the Word of God. Whenever all of a sudden you start looking at holiness and there's this whole new pattern that's there. And there's a whole new understanding of what God wants to see in our life. Nobody is saved by reforming their actions. But whenever a person is saved, we want the Lord to be magnified. It's where that worship comes in. And then, thirdly, rejecting the flesh, it brings joy. He says, having no confidence in the flesh. Whenever a person receives Jesus, they understand just how pointless it is to try to follow the things of the flesh. This is really a, a huge hurdle that people often have problems reconciling. They, they don't really know exactly, well, what does that really mean? And what are those things of the flesh? What are those things that I actually try versus what, what God is working in me. How does that, how does that reconcile? So Paul dives in here. So secondly, so a new course of life, it involves purity, but it also means a renewed perspective. A renewed perspective. Now look at what he says verse number four. He's given himself as an illustration. He says, though I might have, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he says, if there's any other man that thinks uh, that he can trust in the flesh for his salvation, he says, I got a better lineup than he does. If anybody thinks that they're going to gain their salvation by something they do, he says, let me tell you, man, I had it down pat, and it doesn't work. So understanding joy means that there is an understanding of salvation. Now think about this, because this is what he's going to be talking about. He's going to be addressing this matter of salvation. We're going to tie it together here in just a second, all right? Because it, it, that, that understanding about real joy, it's going to come because you've got an understanding of salvation as well. Amen. And that's the argument that, that he's going through. He says in verse number 5, he says, circumcised on the eighth day. What's he saying? There's no ritual. There's no ritual that can bring about your salvation. If rituals could save, man, Paul would have been there. He would have been following the law on the eighth day of his birth. Before he even had a good opportunity to, to do something of his own, it was already laid out for him what he was going to do. But he said that didn't do him any good to have favor with God. Today there's, there's religious things that oftentimes people believe are going to bring about salvation. And they bring about this kind of a trust, or they put their trust in it, and it's, and it's actually robbing them of joy because they're putting faith in the wrong things. Like what? Infant baptism is a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Those are things that should not be there. In Scripture, baptism always follows the profession of faith. And a baby cannot express faith in their Savior. Amen. You know, uh, that's not what, the way it's supposed to work at all. So this is one area of teaching that the Roman Catholic Church had, that during the time of Reformation, the Reformers, they didn't step far enough away. They stepped away from the Catholic Church, but they also took some of those things as well that should have been lined up with Scripture. They said, well, you know, that baptism thing, that, that might be good for them to keep on. Lutherans do that same thing. They still practice infant baptism and things of that nature. But, but that's not, it's not going to, if for a Bible believer, you understand that salvation is in Christ alone. Without that understanding, you can lose joy. It, it, if you think that your joy is based on your performance, for Christ instead of in Christ. It'll rob you of joy. He goes on, verse number 5, he says, of the stock of Israel and of the tribe of Benjamin. Man, that's a big one. If relationships could save you, Paul would have been saved. Amen. Not only a relative of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but also of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was the, the only brother that didn't reject Joseph. He was, uh, it was the only tribe that stayed loyal to Judah. The borders of Benjamin's tribes actually came to the holy city. But relationships won't save you no matter how respectable, no matter how honorable that they are. He goes on verse number 5, he says, <clears throat> he says, in Hebrew of the Hebrews. 
If your heritage could save you, Paul would have been a saved man. Nobody is saved because of the color of their skin. Nobody's saved because of their nationality. You're not privileged because you're an American as far as God's eyes. Amen. You're not going to get to heaven and say, I was born in America. You still got to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Everybody stands <clears throat> the same. The blood of Jesus was the price of redemption. His blood is indifferent to the color of your skin. You're not any better or any worse than anybody else. We all stand in need of a Savior. He goes on to verse number 5. He says, as touching the law, a Pharisee. What's he saying? Religion can't save you. Man, you could know all the things. You could, you could be well schooled in the things of religion and it's not going to save you. Paul was as religious as they come, but that wouldn't save his soul. Verse number 6, he says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Here's a good one for you. A positive attitude won't save you. Amen. Well, they're just so happy all the time. <laughs> you won't be for long if you're trusting, you know, in a good positive attitude to get you to heaven. That's not what it is. We, we think it's a terrible thing for Paul. I mean, he, was, he, he said he was persecuting the church, and it was. It was horrible. But, you know, you think about that. Paul did have a good work ethic. I mean, he, he, he doesn't line up with what we think he should have been doing, but he was a good worker. Amen? He wasn't lazy about anything that he did. He had a reputation among the Judaizers. But all it did was just kind of add more cause of blame to his account. And then he, he follows up with that. Look at it, verse number 6. He says, Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He says, keeping the law won't save you. Amen? Getting all your ducks in a row, it won't save you. Paul was not sinless, but he was blameless. He had a good confession that he was a good law-abiding citizen. Man, everything that he had going on, he, he said, it seems like everybody would have been pleased. With, he, he would have been a great neighbor as long as you weren't a Christian. He had standards. He maintained them. He kept the grass cut. He was a good member of the homeowners association. Amen. Nobody would have said differently, but he says, that couldn't save you. Paul is going through all of these things that will not save you with the purpose of saying, guess what? It won't bring you joy either. All these things that we often think that we have to do to be a joyful person, he says, you're missing out. Why is that? Because joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not a working of the flesh. It's not a circumstance in your life. It's not a privilege that you invoke. So without Christ, there is no salvation. Without Christ, there is no joy. Amen. Whenever Paul received Jesus, his, his perspective on things changed. What he saw was important, it changed. What he was pursuing, it changed. The things that he formerly thought were valuable, he says, that ain't worth the first thing anymore. He says, man, I, I earnestly pursued these things. And he says, but it didn't do me any good. Look what he says, verse 7. He says, but what things were gained to me, those I counted, that's past tense, counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count, that's present tense, count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Now, I like what he says there in verse number 8. He says, all things. All things in verse 8. That means there was a complete change in what Paul ascribed value to. All those things. All those things he recognized. He says, man, I was doing all of this stuff. But none of it was worthy of bringing any joy. Nothing would be as important as knowing the Lord Himself. So that would bring rejoicing in the current day whenever you recognize Christ for who He is. And then you've got eternal rejoicing to come. Amen. Amen. And I like how he said it. He says, verse number 8, he says, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Paul didn't just say, all that stuff that I did was of no value. He didn't say that. He says, I counted all things as loss. He said those things that he actually used to live for actually took away from his value of life. Right. He didn't just say it didn't have any value. He says because of all these things, he says, I counted it as dumb. Uh, you, can you, can have a, you can have a decent pair of jeans that really don't have any value. You can have some jeans with dung on them. Guess what? It took away from the value. He said, well, I didn't have much to begin with. Now it's taken away. 
Look at, he says, all those things, he says, I, he says, those things were counted as loss. He said, there was, it wasn't a matter of saying there was no net gain from everything that I did. He said, all the things that I was doing was actually taken away from the value of life. All of those things I was doing, it, it wasn't just leaving me even killed. It was actually taken away from the joy that I should have been able to know. He says, that's what I found in Christ. Verse number 9, it says, in verse 8 he says, that I might win Christ. And then verse 9 says, and be found in Him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death. Paul gives a list of things that he now highly values. He says, all that stuff that I did before, he said, it was just taken away from, from the joy that I should have known. But he says, now I've, I know what to really value. Paul valued the salvation of his soul above anything that he could have ever lost. Whenever Paul was trying to fill his life with the things of the flesh, it was all about his efforts. It was all about his accomplishments and, and his work and, and his this and that. But salvation made him realize that joy was not the things of outward show. It was not about the stuff that he could possess. It wasn't about how well that the neighbors thought about him. He says, joy is found in your position in Christ. It's who you are in Christ. It was knowing that his sins were forgiven. That's what he said in Ephesians 1, 6, that he was accepted in the beloved. He had a heavenly father. He had eternal salvation. He knew who he was in Christ. That's what gave him joy. He valued his growing relationship. He describes it there in verse number 10. He says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable of it unto his death. He's got four things there. He had a, first of all, he had a desire to know Christ. He had a desire to know Christ. Not just the ability to know. There's a big difference in your ability to know or the things that you know and a desire to know. Uh, we're in a world that loves to know stuff. Amen? Uh, I don't know how many conversations we've had. Where was, we were looking up something the other day with one of the kids. We, we were driving somewhere, and I, that's what it was. I, I've always got uh, James looking for the price of diesel. I'm like, find the cheapest place for diesel. And so we're, we're driving somewhere, and, you know, it's, it's always exciting. You know, we're in Nacogdoches. It's like, 375! You know, we're pulling in. But, but anyway, whenever we're going through and, and we start talking about uh, these things, he was like, I wonder where the... When the first gas station was. Where was that? I don't know. Hey Siri. <laughs> when was the first gas station? The first gas station was, you know, I forgot. How did I forget that? Because I don't care. That's not helping me with my price of diesel. That's right. Amen. If I could go back to that day and they'd say, we're going to honor that price. Since you looked it up, we're going to give it to you for 10 cents. You know, <laughs> great. That'd be wonderful. But otherwise, I just don't care. Yeah. See, there's, there's this thought that it's all about more you know, more you know, more you know. And God says, do you desire to know? He says, I'll tell you. Paul says, I'll tell you what joy is. It's whenever I just desire to know that I may know him. It's not, not having everything figured out. It's not having the Bible memorized. It's just knowing Jesus. That's first. He had a desire to know. Something else about his joy, he, had, he understood he had a resurrected life. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That's a spiritual power. That's not a, that's not a physical power. It's not a material power. It's the power to live a godly life. It's that power to resist temptation and serve the Lord. Think about it. Whenever, we, whenever somebody follows the Lord and believes his baptism and said, dead to the old life, risen to walk in the newness of life. What is that? It's a testimony. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Amen? That happens whenever you receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, not the baptism of water. But that is a picture of saying, hey, uh, because you are alive in Christ, you have the ability to know what it is to resist temptation and serve the Lord. You can have a resurrected power life. Third, he had, a, he had a renewed perspective about suffering. He says, the fellowship of his sufferings. You know, Jesus said, in the world, ye shall have tribulation. Amen. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But with the right view of eternity and salvation, it causes you to value the difficult days as well as those where it seems like everything's going good. 
Paul could testify that. Remember, the guy in jail. Amen. He says, I, I just want to be able to fellowship with his sufferings. He said, okay. <laughs> I'll let you do that. And guess what you'll learn? You'll learn that there's rejoicing to be had because of the very presence of God wherever it is that you may be. Amen. Then he learned the joy of submitting to God. It says, being made conformable unto his death. Because of Christ, even the thought of death is gain. It's to be present with the Lord. Paul learned the value of what it meant to have a new course of life. He wasn't trying to live in accordance with the ideas of a lost world. He just wanted to make his goal the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, that's what it's all about. He's writing to the church at Philippi and he says, I want you to know something about this matter of rejoicing. He says, I'm just going to spend a couple of chapters here writing out some stuff that's going to help you to understand that you can rejoice. And he says, I've told you all this before, but he says, it's okay, I'm going to tell you again, because the sooner that you recognize your identity in Christ, the more you can rejoice in His presence regardless of the circumstances. He says, don't miss out on what has been secured for you through a new life in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank You for this day, we thank You, Lord, that You give us the opportunity to be able to rejoice in Your presence. All the things that You lay before us, Lord, that we get to study Your Word together. Lord, that we get to pray together, have this time of fellowship together, see lives change together. Lord, You've been doing such a mighty work. We're so thankful for that. And I pray that You would just continue to direct our steps, help us to honor You in all things. Thank You, Lord, for this group that comes out on a Wednesday night. I pray, Father, that You would Help us, Lord, to just cement these things into our hearts and lives. Help us to be able to live for the cause of Christ, to see our rejoicing that's available to us through You. We're just so thankful. Father, I pray that You'd watch over us now as we depart from this place. Give us the traveling grace that we need. And Lord, we just look forward to the next time that we get to come together again. We thank You for it all and praise You in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dismissed.